uh, call the select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is anything that's not currently on the agenda. This is Trevor. I've got one real quick. Just want to remind folks who are joining us remotely to stay muted unless you're speaking so that way we can prevent any of the feedback loop issues we had a couple of months ago. And then so unmute to come on and mute to, to jump back off and then you know, raise your hand or, or use some of the other tools if you need us to, to find you in the in-between. My name is Jesse Schmidt. I'm from Orange County Restorative Justice. I'm not sure if I would be part of the public comment period or on the agenda during the um, budget conversation regarding our um, request for appropriation. You talked to Kim the other day, so that would be yeah. for the public hearing, right. I think, on the budget. So that'll come pretty soon. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Too. All right. Um, Seeing none, we'll move forward with approval of the agenda. Move to approve it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is the draft um, 23 budget hearing. I'll give you the, the intro here. Um, what you got in the packets and before you tonight is what we're calling version one of the draft 23 budget. Um, it focuses on general highway library, police, and there's some water and wastewater budgeting in there as well. This is the version that uh, last appeared before the budget committee back in November when it was endorsed there. Um, we've decided to start at this point since that's kind of the common baseline. We will have a need to move to what we'll call version two in this case, just to reflect a few different things, not the least of which is we now know um, both what our employee mix is. We had some vacancies or uncertainties or some older assumptions back in November. New employees, um, uh, we know that there are gonna be some changes to the levels of coverage folks have. So um, health insurance costs will factor in there, retirement costs, we've hired people at different rates of pay, so there's some, most of the adjustments that you'll see between version one and version two, if nothing else happens, will be on that personnel end of things. Um, and we could talk a little bit about what that would be. It'll be more than version one, again, if nothing else happens. Um, but the idea would be that when you have a kind of a second budget hearing or subsequent meeting, that might be when we incorporate all those things in and you look at it look at that product at one time. But where we're at in the aggregate for version one, um, just to kind of go through the, the four main, I'm calling the main ones in terms of their, um, their taxpayer funded, the water and wastewater or enterprise funds, so those are user rates that apply to the people who are within those districts. What we're talking about with the general fund from 22 to 23, looking at an increase of about 4.9% from year to year. With version one, that's about two and a half cents on the tax rate. That's 162,000. In going back through those numbers, a bulk uh, or a significant bulk of the increase are in um, costs such as retirement. Um, you know, $54,000 of that increase from year to year. You could think of it as retirement-related increases that go from um, being in the state employees retirement system and having some of the underfunding issues there they've been raising the employer contributions notably so we're expecting we're going to go from a little less than 14 percent when we put together the budget for 22 we've already jumped up to 19 and a half percent in the current fiscal year and we're projecting that we'll be at about 20 percent as the employer contribution in fiscal 23 so that six or so percent jump across all those employee categories is a $54,000 increase on the general fund end and then you'll see it it shows up in the um, in the highway end to to a, to a lesser amount um, did you say 24 percent I think we're gonna go yeah uh, up to 20 percent at least yeah um, is what's in that in those salary sheets there's another, in the general fund, another $30,000 in reserve transfers. There's $55,000 in capital reserve transfers on the highway end, so we're putting more money into those capital investments. There are some monies associated with um, uh, 
buildings and grounds and, and recreation based um, changes, notably in some of the staffing areas. We've gone to the hybrid employees on a full-time model, so you see some of those show up in the building and grounds budget when you look at those increases from year to year. Um, and then uh, we are seeing some reductions in some other areas, such as there's about 34,000 in highway debt service that comes off. But really, in the, in the aggregate, there's not much new from year to year when you think of it from the perspective of, of programming or services. It's really, we are going to keep doing what we started to do this year, try to invest in infrastructure with this budget, or, or at least capital investments, maybe more broadly. So that could be everything from paving and gravel roads to bridges and culverts to um, you know, implementing what comes out of some of the energy auditing process for this building, among others. Um, and so it covers all of that ground, um, and then try, we're just going to try to build um, from a service perspective um, on what we're doing with some of the um, framework that we've got. When you see when we get to version two, we might talk about there's an idea to move a buildings and grounds employee over into a recreation facilities role, so taking existing resources and maybe moving them around, and then that might have some impacts in terms of what the dollar amount would be. They're already included in some of the version two forecasting that we've already done um, for next time, but aren't in this first version, in large part because we didn't have the idea at, at that point. It, it came out as we started to talk about where we're at, what we needed to do, um, and the ice rink conversations prompted some of that along as well. So there could be some additional changes, but they're gonna look to use existing resources in different ways or move them around a little bit can go through individual lines if you want. I think I've covered them in broad strokes. You'll notice that in version one, you'll see uh, the $1.5 million tax anticipation note. We're not including that in, in some of these numbers here. There's a, a revenue and an expenditure, and they essentially wash each other out. That's the money we borrow um, to pay for services until those first tax installments come, and then we pay it off throughout the course of the year. So there's really only about a I think it's about a $14,000 general fund cost associated with the interest charge there, which is already in that, um, that number I gave you earlier, uh, $3.4 million for the general fund budget. We'll also talk about capital plans and projects at the next meeting right now. We have just kind of a general sense of where everything should fit. You'll see that the reserve transfers are largely increased in key categories. This lets us spend some more time with, say, our new highway superintendent and identify those gravel road projects. We'll look to pull from the paved road projects that were identified last year to at least block out, say, $250,000 worth of paving again this year. And from there, we're going to build that multi-year paved road plan using um, the paving condition index and the software. <coughs> Once we get past bud season spring, we'll be able to build that, especially now that we're staffing. You recall back in the fall between COVID-related disruptions in, in service um, to key transitions in finance and highway. Um, we've gotten um, pushed back a little bit in some of our, our capital planning, uh, planning efforts. Um, and so we'll look to at least identify something for forward progress. And then we'll have to have some conversations about um, the sidewalk machine perhaps in terms of the one that we have is, is toward the end of its useful life and what does uh, what does the next step there look like and then maybe also the East Randolph truck that comes up year over year that's been highlighted by that department as still a key area of need knowing that it's wrapped up in some larger conversations and we should have hopefully a better number um, or an updated number for that truck um, what it looks like at least in base strokes that we do have the reserves sufficient either now or projected to fund all of that stuff that I've, that I've talked about using those resources. So we, we feel pretty good um, with where we're at. We just have a lot of question marks related to some of those planning efforts. ARPA funds, the Maple Street project cost is going to be really tight to the town meeting warning year, so we may have to think of a different way to keep moving that project forward. Um, uh, like I mentioned, the ARPA funds are in there. There's some changes in the and the allowed uses there that might more easily enable their deployment in other places. So 
that's the harder one to really nail down at, at this point, but we will come up with something for 23 that has some detail to it using those basic parameters and then continue to build up through town meeting and beyond into that much larger um, out years model. It also lets our newer people get some time to, um, particularly on the highway end, get to know the equipment needs, the operator tendencies, the community, and then identify um, what we want to do with trucks, heavy equipment, some of these pieces, or um, culvert projects, for example, which ones might rise to the top. And so we'll look to, to pin more of that down, but it's not in this version one budget that you have here tonight. And so it's a little iterative. This is later than I think we'd like to be in a normal year. Um, I think most of us would give anything at this point to have something that we would call a normal year. Um, <laughs> and, and so maybe we can plan on somehow incorporating that in. But um, we still have time between now and really the end of the month is when we have to warn town meeting. And from a capital perspective, um, the important piece with that is just that's if we're going to put any money from the general fund to the highway fund over, it's got to be identified on that end. So the reserve transfers are already in there. Those are unlikely to change as we get to the, to the end line. So we do have some flexibility. If we, if we need to keep talking about that piece, we can do that beyond that town meeting warning marker, but we'd certainly want to have it as soon as possible so then voters go in knowing kind of a full suite of what we're talking about doing in fiscal 23. A little bit of an overlapping time cycle there. But that's the, the quick and dirty four version one. Like I said, that's the version that the um, uh, budget committee last saw in November. Cliff was able to put that together before he left for his new opportunity. Um, very likely little, there's very likely little to change in version two other than those personnel costs. We do have, um, did ask department heads to submit ahead of time uh, with a deadline of yesterday at noon any additions or amendments. The listers highlighted one that essentially would take some of their salary lines and reset them to they'd be level with fiscal 23, so that's an easy kind of change to make. There's no real net dollar impact. And then uh, there's a proposal to add $5,000 for economic development for support for things like our marketing and tourism, tourism grant initiative we're in, engaged in. And Josh could speak to that at some point. Um, that has very little impact overall. It's a one-tenth of one penny kind of uh, addition to the budget. And then we may have some others here in the audience who have requests. Um, the special appropriations list that you have in version one is sort of from that standard of everybody's requesting the same amount as the year prior. We'll go back through and double check all that. We do know there's at least one organization that would like to request um, consideration for an increase and some of the complications again go back to COVID and if you've got to petition your way on and, and it's harder to collect signatures um, in a COVID era than, than not. Uh, I think that's the, the baseline if there are any particular questions I can help. One of these things is we're still learning everything that's in here so if we can't answer anything tonight we'll run down an answer and bring it back as well. So. Looks like Cliff has a question, it looks like. Dude, is there any questions on that from the board? I have a question. Um, I, I'm assuming that uh, like ARPA funds don't need to go through a budget cycle. There are no ARPA funds in this for fiscal 23. Do you think once we identify where they're going to go, um, part of that process can be identifying what's the right way to deploy them, so as some of that guidance. I think, ideally, we'd like to show them in and out th through a budget to make sure that'll make it easier to report on the back end. We might be able to figure out some ways, though, to, um, to work through that. Otherwise, in terms of they'd still run through our uh, accounting system, you know, through mm -hmm. NEMRIC, would show up sort of in and, and, and out. But it would, be, it would be nice to identify the uses, show them, you know, ARPA revenue in, ARPA expenditure out. Um, and do they have to go through that for some reason, or is that? Uh, no, I think we just want to make sure whatever they go through, we're able to fully and accurately account for 
for what they're used for so that when we report on those uses, because we have an, at least an annual reporting requirement that will begin this April even before we've spent any of the money. And that will stay with us at least through the 2026 deadline to, to spend the funds. So these are, these are also time limited too. It's pretty much between now and we have to obligate them within the next two years and then spend them by 26. So be transparent in our process. Yeah. Yeah. Any other board questions? Seeing none, we have a question from Cliff. Um, it, it's more of a comment, Trini, that um, I just wanted to remind everybody that um, Trevor had talked about the cost of the TAN um, and th to remind everybody that there's an offsetting interest revenue line item that offsets that cost because we've actually got an arbitrage where we're going to make money on that. That's right. Yes. We like those. Maybe we could get a few more of them going. <laughs> We are limited as to how much we can borrow, though. I know. Bummer, huh? <laughs> um, so, Trevor, if I understand correctly, what you would like is the board members to study the budget for any comments and to set a date um, for the second hearing. Is that correct? Yeah. We Normally, we'll do one, I guess, end of December and another one early January where we're a little backed up on that and it happens to coincide with a need to warn town meeting anyway and until we set the budget we can't set the town meeting warning so we were looking for we'd suggested next thursday but if there's another date uh, that works we can do that next thursday is the opening of the warning window between 30 no less than 30 no more than 40 days from town meeting and so the the 20th is is really that um, and then it does tie in with being earlier is better than later, especially if we're going to go with a traditional with the floor meeting on the Saturday before that makes sure that we don't run into any weird um, timeline issues with the 30 and the 40. If we ended up Australian ballot on town meeting day, it sticks to that 20th and um, 30th of January metric a little more cleanly, but we'll, we'll work through it. And then what we'll do is if you once you set that date, we'll send you those version two updates. So then we'll just be working from there uh, moving forward. So those will include, once again, those health insurance and other personnel costs that are being updated or have been updated and will be shown in those version. Is there any board members that have a conflict next Thursday? Works for me. Works for me. Uh, not for me. Works for me. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> and I'm going to be probably on a plane at that point, so can't help you. How about the following Monday? Uh, <clears throat> that does not work for me, unfortunately. How about Tuesday? <laughs> not good for me. No. Keep going. <laughs> about Friday morning. Uh, no, sorry, can't help you there either. Your plane's already landed, Barry. No, you don't understand. <laughs> it has it. It's only gotten through phase one. Okay. <laughs> I won't be home until Friday afternoon. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> Anytime after that, I'm here for the next <coughs> month and a half. Um, what about Saturday morning? Sure. The 22nd? Yeah, oh, yes. I, I could do that. What's your Saturday morning look like, Trevor? Are we getting into pre-scheduled stuff for you? I, uh, I might miss a game or two at a basketball tournament for third and fourth graders, so I'm missing very exciting hoops action. But uh, that's the time does the game start? Uh, we don't even know if we're having that yet between COVID and it hasn't been scheduled, so it's possible we don't miss anything at all. But we'll, we'll make it work. I, I help out, so if I'm not there, um, they'll be able to carry on. As important as I am, they'll carry on. 
<laughs> How early that morning can people do so Trevor can make his tournament if they haven't? I can start at eight. I can start at seven thirty. Oh boy. Right. Yeah, okay. You morning people. How about what? Nine? How about nine? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> half, the, half the day is gone at nine o'clock. Okay. Oh, well, I can do nine o'clock. I could do eight, eight or nine. Yeah. Um, eight doesn't work for you, Larry? Oh, it, it, it could. I'll probably still be drinking coffee. Oh, well, that's I'm going to drink that. Oh, that's I fine. Will. We'll all drink coffee. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, let's go with Saturday at eight. Saturday right. at eight. Sounds good. Thank you all. All right, next up is the consent calendar. This is meeting minutes. Um, I just have a question before we move this item. I'm not seeing warrants anymore to approve. Is everybody else seeing them? Yeah. Hmm. I've been seeing them. Yeah, so have I. Yeah, I think I got them. <laughs> Well, as long as you have a quorum and enough people are approving them, but I haven't seen them. So get, somewhere my email address might have got changed or something. That's what I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. I got a hundred, it must have been 121 pages here this time, so. <laughs> oh no, that was the board packet. That was the board packet. Where's the warrants? Yeah, so where are they? Didn't I just... Yeah, they, they came separate email, so it's probably something with an email address. So we'll we'll check that out to make sure that the one that Michelle's using to get these to all of you that she's got um, everybody's oh, raised. I thought yeah. maybe it was that I wasn't there wasn't any because there's it's not listed on the agenda to approve the warrants. Oh no, we're we're still we're still spending the money for better or worse. <laughs> oh, I'm, I've gotten all those. Okay. So, uh, do we want um, the agenda only warned uh, meeting minutes, and we didn't change it when we did the approval of the agenda? So we'll have to remember to put warrants for both months on next month's agenda. So the consent calendar tonight only has meeting minutes. Do we have any comments on the meeting minutes? Move to approve. If not a motion. Move to approve we, the uh, December meeting minutes. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Justin carries. You had a question, Larry? Uh, I was just. I'm wondering if since we're meeting um, a week from Saturday that we could approve it then if we wanted, if that was convenient. We can. Sure can. Good idea. Yeah, next up is business. Well, so, sorry to um, jump in, Trini. We, we moved so quick through the budget hearing. There was somebody in the crowd who had um, something to bring up to you on one of the special appropriation requests. Didn't know if you wanted to hear it quickly right now, and then we can incorporate anything that you decide into into the stuff for the 22nd. Sure. So we've got Jesse from the Orange County Restorative Justice Center, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and I don't know where to look. <laughs> I see your owl device there, so I'll look yeah. at that, I guess. Um, so. Thank you for giving me a, a few minutes here. I'm the director of the Orange County Restorative Justice Center. We serve all of Orange County with uh, court diversion, pretrial services um, programs, um, as well as civil uh, diversion programs. Um, we also do reentry services for people returning to our communities after incarceration. Uh, that includes reentry services, transitional housing. Uh, connecting people to mental health and substance abuse services and other community resources to help people gain stability while they're going through a court process or after they're returning after being in jail. Um, that's a quick synopsis of what we do. Uh, Randolph um, 
every town in Orange County provides an appropriation to support our work. We are 100% uh, grant funded, um, or grant and donations um, and town appropriations. Uh, and we do collect um, fees for, our pro for some of our programs, but we have a sliding scale and as many of you probably understand, um, the economic <coughs> circumstances of most of the people we work with are, uh, most people are low income and so we uh, waive or lower our fees almost all of the time for people. Um, we, uh, before the pandemic began, uh, we began a, a process of um, requesting increases from towns. It had been over 10 years um, since we had requested increases in our appropriations from towns in Orange County. Um, and uh, Randolph was on our list. Um, there are two towns that uh, the pandemic, we got caught in the pandemic. Um, it was Randolph and Topsom. So those are our last two towns that haven't um, provided an increase in appropriation. Uh, we did go out full gusto this year um, to collect the petitions that are required to request an increase. Um, we have over 130 signatures. Um, I will say that um, over the holidays, um, people who had volunteered to collect signatures from us became very reluctant to do that. Um, our staff were going to pick up um, for this final two weeks here um, after the holidays, and I've had two staff people um, who got COVID um, last week, and, are, and then I had other staff who had to quarantine because of close contact with those staffers. Um, so our ability to finalize our petition process in Randolph um, was brought to a quick halt um, by our current circumstances. Um, our appropriation um, from Randolph has been $600, and we were asking for an increase to $1,200. Um, I have the petitions here that we did gather <laughs> um, in, our, uh, in our efforts, um, but I know that we are not going to be able to um, to meet you know the expectation of I think it's 175 signatures. So I guess what I'm requesting is an accommodation um, to accept um, the number we did get as a sufficient for um, re putting that uh, request for an increase um, into the budget. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about what we do or our finances or anything. I see Henry is on. Henry, what is the number that they need for signatures? You're muted if you're trying to answer that, Emery. This is maybe there. Um, so, Trevor, a special appropriation. If I'm not mistaken, requires a percentage of the voter registration. Is that correct? Yeah, the petition would be the, what is it, 5% of the registered voters. It's a number between, it's less than 200, I don't know the exact number. And then one of the wrinkles might be, I think today might have been the deadline for, it was a deadline for some petitioned articles, if not all of them as well, but Emory would have to clarify that. So there could be an added wrinkle based on statutory timelines in terms of whether- Trevor, I am here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, today was the deadline, unfortunately. That 5% is right, but today was the deadline. I believe it was 3 p.m. And so Emory, does the select board have the authority to not follow that process? Only if it gets added as a budget line item, correct? I, it would have to go through the budget process, I believe, yes, at this point. Because that's not part of the legislature's changes. Um, that's only for candidate consent. Yes, yeah, but you'd have the broad authority to, um, I think the board, it's, it would already be on the draft warning based on the policy if we were at last year's number. And you do have some discretion as a board whether or not you add things that are essentially town. I mean, you can add anything to a, to a warning within, not I shouldn't say anything, within certain parameters. Um, so I think you'd be using your broad warning-based authority to add it as a question, much like you would if there were some kind of advisory article, for example, that got petitioned. 
I think you've got the ability to to do it. You're just foregoing the petition-based money change. But we can look into that too if you want. Pretty sure you're right. My concern would be that the rules were already out there for everybody. So if any entity wanted to come in for funds or wanted to come in for an increase, they had the same set of rules that they had to meet. Um, if we were gonna not require it up front, we probably would have seen some other organizations coming in looking for additional funding, would be my guess. But we got into this with um, some of our discussion back years ago with Stagecoach. And I believe we were told if we didn't follow the normal practice, they had to become a line item in the budget. Could I ask another question, Trini? Sure. Um, were all the other towns doubled in the amount too? Um, we did, uh, the way we determined our increase was based on percentage of the county population and also the caseload that comes from each town. Um, so not every town was, um, some towns were double. Uh, we also have, did a baseline, um, like a minimum of 350. So the smaller towns all um, are at 350 and then the larger towns are, are somewhere in between. But they, proportionality based on uh, population and, and the number of cases we see um, from the towns. So there is a, there's a system by which you do that? Yes. Well, I'll make the motion that we put that restorative justice in at $1,200 for this next year. I'm sorry. Pat, can you say that again? I, I lost the last bit of what you're I'm that sorry. Last sentence. Yep. I'll make the motion that we put restorative <laughs> justice on the ballot for $1,200, and that would include if we have to put it in the budget, which I don't think we do, that we do it that way. Yeah, I would, I would second that. I, it sounds like they made a good faith effort to, to try and get this done and, and were thwarted. And it seems like an extenuating circumstance. I'd be happy to support that request. And we don't, really don't want them out spreading COVID either. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second on the table, it, but I need to just understand the motion a little better, Pat. Your motion is to put it out as a special appropriation for $1,200 or in the budget. Was that put it, it? Put it in at $1,200 as a special appropriation. And if for some reason Trevor finds we can't do that, which I don't think is the case, to put it in the budget at $1,200 for just this one year. So, so you know, it, just, uh, to open it up for discussion, that means that the voters don't get a say in that. They get, right. Like they do in a special appropriation. For one year, yeah. Okay. But I think it can be a special appropriation. So. Um, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Tr Trini, if I can just ask, um, they're already in uh, uh, on the ballot before the voters for six hundred dollars. So this represents a doubling. Um, I'm not quite sure, and, and maybe this is what Trevor needs to explore. I'm not quite sure. Um, it, it, I don't know if we're able to amend the special appropriation question at this point in time without, without opening the door to other people, as you suggested, asking us to do that after the deadline date in the future. So can we just move to appropriate the $600 additional in the budget and allow the voters to vote just on the initial $600 that was previously requested. So right now we have a motion to either 
uh, amend the special appropriation to 1200 without signatures, waiving that requirement, or if that's not allowed, put it in the budget. So we would need to vote on that. If it's down, then we can talk about other ways to do it. I'm just really concerned that it's setting a precedent and we haven't allowed these to go in as a budget line item. So you're now bringing in the special appropriations in as a budget line item. Um, you know. There's a little bit of a policy wrinkle too, in terms of the towns, I don't know if we call it a special appropriations policy, but essentially we have something in place that guides these types of requests. And so when you look ahead to the draft warning on the agenda, you'll see We've got that list of agencies that have made or organizations that have made requests before. And what that policy says is that if you're going to keep that amount level, you essentially are then um, automatically placed on the warning for the following year and waives the petition requirements. And where the petition requirements come in, I think, are if you're new or if you're asking for an increase. So I don't know. And we'll look into make sure there's no statutory concern, but I think it might be more of a policy question about do these circumstances warrant deviating from that policy about increases um, as it relates to the, to the ones that have already made it on. And, and, and are you comfortable with that as a policy choice given everything that's going on? But we'll look into the statutory wrinkle, but I think you do have enough latitude there that that, that likely won't be the impediment, but we'll make sure. I, I'd like to, to say that um, it does seem like this is an extenuating circumstance. I don't think anybody would reasonably expect that we're really setting a precedent here. It seems really clear that this, this is unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the other thing I'd, I'd say is that if we do go this route, that um, the second part of Pat's motion really should be amended to, um, to add, to put $600 as a budget light item, because I, it seems like it'll still, if, if we can't make if we can't amend the the town the the special appropriations from six hundred to twelve hundred, it seems like it would stay at six hundred. Um, so we would only need to add six hundred in the regular budget. Okay, let's unsort this one. So, um, are you you're backing off your second to the original motion? Yeah, because I think if if I think we don't we're not gonna we don't want. Six hundred dollars to appear as a special appropriation, and then, and then also add in twelve hundred dollars as a right, right. Item. Yeah. We would only want to add in six hundred to make up the twelve. Right, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. And so, Pat, um, you want to amend your motion, or you want to keep it the way it is? No, my intent was having a total of twelve hundred. Right. Is that what you're saying, Larry? Yeah. Larry is saying exactly that. It's just that um, it clarifies that the second 600 would, would failing the ability to put it into the special appropriations uh, portion of the warning, the separate 600 would, would come out of the budget. And, and, and so it's a total of 1,200 either way, as, as opposed to a potential of 1800 if you take 600 and 1200. Am, am I interpreting that correctly, Larry? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's fine with me because my intent was 1200. So, so to clarify, is your motion now, Pat, to um, approve, if we legally can, an increase in the special appropriation line to $1,200? If we can't, then it goes to a, keeps them at a six hundred dollar level that they're at now, and puts six hundred dollars in the budget. Yes. Okay. So Pat has amended his motion. <laughs> now we need a second. I'll second the amended motion. I have a motion and a second on the table. And before we have any more discussion, hearing none. Call the issue. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. And there, <laughs> we really appreciate it. <laughs>
All right, so we're now on to uh, the FY21 audit presentation and discussion. And before we start that, um, I would just like to thank Cliff for all the work he did for the town of Randolph. And he kind of snuck out without having any type of opportunity to publicly recognize him. But the efforts that he undertook when he came in as the finance director were just phenomenal. And the place that we find the town now after his tenure with us are just awesome. So I would personally like to thank you, Cliff, for all your efforts. Me too. Amen. Me four. <laughs> and with that, we will move on to hearing another awesome result of Cliff's works. I hope Bonnie is here. I hope that's her on the phone because I'm not prepared to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate the accolades. Thank you. Do we have uh, Bonnie with us? I don't know who that phone. Can we get who's on uh, 802-249-7836? Hi, it's Brooke Dingledean. I had to step away from my um, laptop. Uh, I'm <laughs> listening. <Come> on <laughs> Would you like to present the town audit, Brooke? <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> as, as they say, I went to law school, so I didn't have to do math. <laughs> there you go. That's why I majored in English. <laughs> now, um, how do I mute myself again? <laughs> Do you guys do know. that? Trevor, how does uh, Brooke's number get muted? It, it, well, it looks like she's muted on here, so I don't know. Nope, she's down on the phone number. Oh, she had to step okay. away from her computer. Her computer's muted. It's the phone. Uh, well, I can I can just mute the actual phone, so no worries. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, don't I, don't think, I don't think I can. Oh, yeah, good. There is a um, command so you can use on like Zoom. I just blanking on what it is. Yeah, so we, here's your number right there. So, so we can set this agenda item aside and yeah. come back to it if we see her join us. Does that make sense? Sure. All right, so let's consider current use changes. So this is just a, um, this is Jamie bursting the assessor lister. Talking. Is this all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is to be in accordance of Title 32, Section 4261. It's basically two current use parcels were accepted into the grand list year, but in December 20, um, December 28th. Um, 2021. So it's just a change to their values that they were originally taxed on. That was in the original grand list. It's like the other four, two, six, one forms I've given you in the past. For you to approve that this change happened. Okay. Do we have any questions from board members? Any questions from anyone else? If not, any motions? Move to approve the two changes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is a discuss the Davis Road Solar Project for the request of Michael Finder. And for the record, I am recusing myself from this conversation uh, or from any decision uh, because the property is owned by my late dad. So it's all yours, Larry. I believe you could still um, 
lead the discussion? You can, you can lead the discussion even if you're not <laughs> you know, voting. I'm happy to do it. I just okay. think it's a, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, is, is my thought. Okay, so um, I see we have Michael Binder on here. Um, so if Michael would like to uh, let us know what what he's asking of the board. And he's here in the room with us, so I don't know if you're ready to go, Michael. Yeah, would you like me to read the letter into the record, or is it in the packet and there's not it's sufficient? Not, it's in the packets, I think maybe just uh, at least a brief we'd like overview. You just, uh, yep, just give a synopsis of what you're looking for so it's on the record. Okay, um, we're requesting that you rescind the preferred sites letter for the Norwich Solar Technologies Project on Davis Road. The reason is that the project does not conform to the Randolph Town Plan. Um, would you like me to give you the background? I mean, that's basically what we're asking. Um, Maybe so, a little, a little uh, background in terms of wh why you think it doesn't um, conform to the town plan, um, other process elements you've participated in. Just maybe round out, okay. how do we get here today? Sure, I'll be glad to. Uh, in June, uh, Norwich Solar Technologies came before the Randolph Planning Commission to seek approval of a 500,000 watt uh, solar array <laughs> off Davis Road and Route 14. Uh, they told the Planning Commission that the project was in conformance with the town plan and they were granted a preferred sites letter. Subsequently, the Randolph Select Board took up the issue and at that meeting, uh, we attended by Zoom and objected to the map they presented which showed their project on our property. Uh, Brendan Malley told us the property lines on the map were not correct but that Norwich Solar Technologies would have a surveyor identify the property line before construction would begin and they were uh, granted a preferred sites letter for the project. Um, on the project site plan that Norwich Solar submitted to the Vermont Public Utilities Commission, this is after the select board, um, they did correct the property line issue, but the site plan also shows that the majority of the disturbed area uh, and uh, were on slopes greater than 25% and that about one third of the solar panels themselves were on slopes of greater than 25%. Uh, on October 21st, uh, 2021, we sent a letter to the Planning Commission alerting them to the slopes issue and requested it be on the agenda. At that next meeting, we asked them to rescind their preferred sites letter because it violated the town plan prohibition of commercial uh, of solar development on steep slopes. One of the reasons for the steep slope prohibition is to increase resilience of the landscape in extreme rain events. We were surprised that Norwich Solar Technology did not attend the meeting but we learned at the meeting that Chairman Sonny Holt had been communicating privately with Norb Solar Technology, and Norb Solar Technology assured him that the average slopes conformed to the town plan. All members of the Planning Commission in attendance uh, agreed that the project was not in conformance with the town plan. One commission member said in the meeting, obviously this slopes issue was not a factor that was ever discussed at the June Planning Commission meeting. That's probably partially our fault for not knowing the text better and asking them questions. So we can take some responsibility for that. Norwich Solar Technologies was not forthcoming with that. The Planning Commission members at the public meeting all agreed they would consult with the town attorney to see what his position was on rescinding the preferred sites letter. After the December meeting, the Planning Commission members communicated privately by email with each other and with Norwich Solar Technologies. The Norwich Solar Technology attorney told them that the town had no legal basis to prohibit their development on steep slopes. But NSD promised that if the Planning Commission did not rescind the letter, they would not place solar panels on slopes greater than 25%. Now, without waiting to hear from the town attorney, which they had agreed to do at the December public meeting, the Planning Commission voted three to one, voting by email, not to rescind the preferred sites letter. The reasons, as they were expressed in their emails, were that correcting their error might subject the town to an expensive lawsuit and that Norwich Solar Technology had promised not to put those panels on steep slopes. We are disturbed that the Planning Commission negotiated in private the slopes issue with Norwich Solar Technology. It is not their job to negotiate with applicants. Their job is to deny a preferred sites letter to any project that is not in conformance with the town plan. Ultimately, the permit to build the array is issued by the Vermont Public Utilities Commission. If they approve the plan submitted by NST, 
Uh, there is no way for Randolph to enforce the town plan prohibition on commercial solar development on steep slopes. The promise made by Norm Solar Technologies is meaningless. If Randolph wants its town plan to have any meeting, you must rescind the approval of this project. And then um, we have attached a map which was in the packet, and um, it shows large areas, probably about a third, of the solar panels on slopes greater than 25% using the data that they prevented LIDAR data from the state to make these topo maps. So um, it was uncontested that the uh, project violates the town plan. The only question is, what is the remedy? And I think the Planning Commission is a bit naive to think that they can revoke this thing later. If they're worried about lawsuits, they should uh, rescind their letter now, not after uh, construction has begun or further work has been done. So um, I would request that the Select board now, rescind that letter, let Norm Solar Technologies plan a new map, put it before the process again for approval in some way that does not violate the town plan. Uh, if you want, I can uh, try and screen share uh, the map that we put in the packet. Uh, otherwise, um, now, um, do we have anybody on from the Planning Commission? or to talk about the process from their perspective. Sonny's out of town, so I don't think we'll, I don't think he'll be on, but I don't know if Josh wanted to talk to the process a little bit or, or Harry would have been there as well. I'm gonna to defer to Josh because I think that's probably his role here and I'll talk a bit afterwards. Yeah, I guess in terms of the process from what I remember um, now, because it's almost seven months ago, um, I remember the public hearing um, and, and Norwood showing us a map. Um, I, I don't remember all of the conversation around the slopes. Um, I remember the, the topographical map that they showed during their, their presentation. Um, but I don't recall like what the conversation was in terms of the 25% slopes. Um, Do you, do you want to see the, I mean, I, I don't know what maps I have here. Um, I, I can I, speak I, to that. The map that we included in, our, in the packet is uh, taken from the submission to the uh, Public Utilities Commission. It's their final engineering drawing uh, at this point. The one that you'd seen previously at the Select Board and the Planning Commission were preliminary drafts. Uh, this is one where they put a little bit more effort, and they have uh, the elevations are done at one foot intervals. This uh, lighter that they use is pretty amazing, uh, what it can do to make an accurate map. So um, I think that the, the they really need to come back with a a new site plan. Uh, there's not going to be any way they're going to have this be a 500,000 watt uh, solar panel uh, array on on that land if they stay off the the steep slopes. Uh, whether they want to pursue this, you know, at a smaller size or not is, you know, their business. But right now, your business, I believe, is to enforce and uphold the town plan and to correct an error that was made. Uh, they were not forthcoming. They materially misrepresented uh, mm -hmm. that their uh, project met with, you know, conformed with the town plan uh, to both the planning commission and the select board previously, and it's not correct. The, the maps that they submit themselves uh, show that they have quite a bit of the array on steep slopes. Can I, can I speak, please? Right, if, if, at the appropriate time. Um, just uh, let's try to get the facts here. Uh, I, I, so I'm Jim Merriam, uh, Brookfield resident and uh, CEO of Norwich Solar. Uh, 
and I'd love to be able to submit a couple things into the record, uh, which might okay. help. Yep. Uh, yes, you say. Sure. Oh, okay, great. So uh, if I can, there's a, a public document, which is to the Public Utilities Commission, which basically uh, agrees that we will not build on slopes of 25 degrees and install solar on it, and we will stay within the limits of disturbance as proposed. So uh, this is something that is a condition of the Certificate of Public Good that the Public Utilities Commission enforces. If we were to violate that, the Public Utilities Commission would pull as a remedy our Certificate of Public Good, which would prevent us from being able to connect and generate. Obviously, that is not something that we you know, a, a, a bank, or we, or anyone that would want to own that array would comply with or want. So as a measure of enforcement, the Public Utilities Commission, which is their role here, will ensure through this public document that we submitted as a condition of the Certificate of Public Good, we will not install panels in slopes greater than 25 degrees. If that meant it was only a 400 kilowatt system array, that is our risk. But it still would conform to the town plan because we've agreed with the Public Utilities Commission as a condition to not install solar on slopes greater than 25 degrees. Okay, thank you. We have uh, Brooke Finglebean with her hand up. Thanks for uh, letting me speak. <clears throat> um, I was aware of, uh, became aware of this matter before the Planning Commission and attended the December meeting and <clears throat> reviewed the information that was presented and also listened to Mr. Holt about what process he had been engaged in. And I'm not here to um, try to stop anything, any particular project. But I want to go back to something that um, Trini said earlier tonight when she was discussing how rules need to apply equally to everyone. I also want to talk about the duty that the Planning Commission and the Select Board have as government officials to defend our laws and to make sure that the quasi-judicial process that they engage in when they make decisions <laughs> such as this is followed and that open meeting laws are followed and that decisions and conversations and evidence is not accepted and considered in private and talked about over email, which is the equivalent of meeting in person in secret and violating the open meeting law. And the process that happened at the Planning Commission, first of all, was that the commission decided this was in violation of the town plan, but they were worried about getting sued and had a liability concern which frankly is absurd because uh, to rescind a letter based on omissions of material fact, perhaps even intentional, um, would be a pretty difficult case to bring in court. But I was very supportive of Harry's concern and decision to go get a legal opinion. So that's what the Planning Commission said. We're gonna rescind it, but we wanna make sure that we're not going to get in hot water. So the next thing we know, they have decided not to rescind it. There's been no meeting. There's been no lawyer's decision or opinion about anything. They completely reversed their position. And only through a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, was it determined that all of this decision-making was made in private. These were not deliberative sessions or anything of that nature. These were decisions that were made contrary to what the board had decided in public in the meeting and led people to believe was the course of conduct that they were going to do. The other concern is that the substantive U-turn on the position is also very concerning because the information that was obtained from the applicant's attorney is, a, is at best legal argument and certainly not very convincing legal argument. Things like preemption, you can't tell us where we can't put a solar array, which is nonsense read the Apple Hill Solar case that I just took to the uh, Supreme Court and prevailed on. 
The other thing that they bring up is due consideration. You don't have an enhanced energy plan. No one's going to listen to you. That's a bunch of hogwash as well because Apple Hill Solar was a due consideration plan of Bennington Town, which now has an enhanced energy plan. But the Public Utility Commission gave due consideration and said you can't build a solar array on a prominent hillside, <clears throat> very similar situation to this, only we don't even have to interpret what prominent hillside is in this situation. All we have to do is look at a map and see that these slopes that the solar array project is proposed for and the access road are being, are going to disturb areas in excess of 25% grade, in fact, even up to 40% grade. Now, the proper process of the Planning Commission was to say, I'm sorry, you omitted this material fact. You gave us all sorts of information about an argument about how you were in compliance with our town plan. You even cut and pasted the very section of the town plan that talks about where these uh, solar array projects can and cannot go, except when you cut and pasted that, you stopped right before the steep slopes provision and ignored it and led the Planning Commission and the Select Board to believe that you were in compliance with the town plan, which was not correct. They could have said part of the project is there and on average, we're calculating it at, at 10%. Or they could have said, you can't tell us that we can't put it on a 25% grade. Give us our preferred sites letter anyway. Did they do either of those things? No, they didn't tell you about it and managed to get it by the Planning Commission and the Select Board without anyone noticing that there was a provision that said, you can't build these projects on slopes of 25% or steeper. So that, in my opinion, is most concerning. And then to have this open meeting law violation process to follow up after watching one of my neighbors and community members bring forth this information to be corrected so that a preferred sites letter, a rubber stamp by the town saying we, we are in support of this, of this location, how can that be? Not only is it in violation of the town plan, but these people were not frank and honest with you. Omission is just as bad as misrepresentation. The Consumer Fraud Act in Vermont is based on either a material fact misrepresentation by affirmative uh, representation or by omission. So then what do we get? We get told we reverse course, so what? Now, when all of this was going on, I, I just became aware very recently that um, one of the planning commission members had recused themselves, I guess, because they were involved as a realtor in the, the property. And then um, Trini, you, you had recused yourself, which was totally appropriate. And I am not here in any way, shape or form to try to say that this project shouldn't happen. But the way it's currently configured, it is not entitled to a preferred sites letter. I agree with one of the planning commission members who said we were hoodwinked. Although another one said that we should take some responsibility for this for not knowing our own town plan language. So each of these boards, planning commission, select board and the regional planning commission have an independent duty to determine whether or not a preferred sites letter should issue because they all have to sign on to it. So as I understand it, Joan and Michael are coming to you and asking you to rescind the select board approval of that and <clears throat> also to look into what happened at the Planning Commission because you appointed the Planning Commission and you are responsible for whether or not they follow the law of due process, the Constitution of the United States, the state of Vermont and our statutory law in Vermont. They have a duty to do their business in public not to secretly converse and make decisions and figure out what to say to Michael Binder. A lot of this is revealed in the FOIA request materials that were produced pursuant to um, Mr. Binder's lawful request to the town. And I hope that the select board was not involved in that, that conversation as well. But um, it's really incumbent. I, I am speaking to this. I was not interested in getting involved in controversy um, but 
I have a duty to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States and the state of Vermont. I have a sworn duty to do so, as all of you select board members do. And I implore you to look into this to correct the situation um, and make sure that this doesn't repeat itself. This is like the select board holding hearing and having one of their select board members present evidence after a public hearing for consideration in secret without the town knowing about it. That's not okay, and this is not okay. So please do something about it. Thank you very much. Does, um, does anybody know what, is there anybody here that can testify about or talk to us about what the planning commission actually went through and any legal guidance they got or? Hey, uh, Trina, could I interrupt and just, I just wanted to add one more thing because I truly am very um, sincere about this. <clears throat> if these folks don't want to construct their array on slopes of 25% and are going to avoid this, then what they need to do is reconfigure their site plan, bring it back to you and say, okay, we've remedied the problem We've reconfigured it. This is our plan now. I have never heard of having a plan and then saying, well, even though I have a plan that has all these arrays cited on 25% slopes, we're not going to put them there. That to me, uh, you know, every Act 250 permit that has ever been issued for 50 years, and I'm sure every PUC permit that's issued, requires that the permittee construct and operate the project in compliance with all of the plans that are put into evidence and approved by the PUC in this case. And so I, I don't even get how you could put in a site plan and say, oh, but we have a condition that we're not gonna put them on 25% slopes. And what about the access road? That's on 20, much more than 25% slopes. So I'm not, I am here to say not, uh, you know, say no to this, if they want to go change this and come back to you for different approval and say, okay, we remedied the problem, then you look at that and you say, okay, if this passed muster, it gets a thumbs up. But this, um, I'm going to promise you things and Sonny agreeing to that and sure, wink and a nod, that's what is the appearance of impropriety here. And the other thing is, particularly in a situation where uh, folks on boards have had to recuse themselves. You, you make every effort to make sure that everything is transparent and public, not do it all in secret and then figure out what we want to tell the public, which is exactly what happened. So I hope they can reconfigure it and that it can be um, you know, done in compliance with the town plan. But even if it's not, they can go forward and the PUC has the authority to grant permits, even if they're in violation of the town plan. So you could say, I'm sorry, it's not in the violation. It is in violation of the town plan. They can go forward and convince the PUC to give them a permit anyway. Your job is to speak about the town plan, period. Not to negotiate something else that is, that's maybe gonna kind of be okay in somebody else's opinion. So thank you for your time, I appreciate it. One of the things I can do for board members is that we put together the um, response to the public records request. And if we send you that, you'll have each piece of email that's been referenced. Um, took a little time to collect them, but we've got what we think is the pieces that were, were out there in circulation and that everybody's re referenced. So we'll send those to you. I said a question maybe for both Norwich and, and for, for Michael and Joan, um, which is that where are we at in, a, in the PUC timeline and what's next. So in terms of asking any of the entities for action, how does it fit even into that regulatory systems timeline? Do we know what's next there? Is a date for whatever process element comes? Because what the planning commission did, they had, there was a little bit of a deadline that was hoped for based on PUC timing, not necessarily town timing. So I'm just trying to figure out where are we and what's next, I guess, is the simplest way. We're waiting for a scheduling meeting where I believe the next thing would be scheduling for an evidentiary hearing. We will um, be 
doing depositions uh, as possibly uh, uh, cross examinations, calling witnesses, and so forth, uh, depending on how far this needs to go. We're hoping that we won't have to go forward at the PUC and that the uh, select board here will correct their error and stop this and let Norv Solar Technology come back with a different site plan, which will be judged on its own merits. But let me just, if I can follow, I'm just trying to understand the process. If, if the preferred siting letter is one of the nine ways you can obtain preferred siting, but the Public Utilities Commission still regulates the project, would one or even all three parties rescinding a preferred siting letter bump you out of the Public Utilities Commission process? Yes, yes it would. Okay. One or all three? One. one. You need all three. You need all three signatories. So just to recap for everybody, that's Planning Commission, Select Board, and Regional Planning Commission. Sure. And the Regional Planning Commission has already, through Kevin Geiger, opines that they wouldn't revisit their action unless, for some reason, we revisited ours. Um, so they're standing a step back from it, trying to figure out what the local navigation is first before they would do anything. Is that because they based it on our approval? I think because they did, yeah. <laughs> it's a circle, huh? Yeah, it is. Well, yeah. the, the two rivers also reviewed but they do the broader than, than that. They don't, uh, you don't necessarily get two rivers approval or any regional planning commission approval uh, just because local regional bodies did. Actually, I spoke with, Ke or emailed with Kevin Geiger about this uh, also, and he told me that, um, yes, they do certain reviews, but they're not review in compliance with the town plan. They're assuming the town will do that. So they're basically rubber stamping uh, the business about uh, the town plan. So if I could make one comment back, it's my understanding that it, this meeting was about rescinding the select board's letter, and that's based upon a violation of 25 degree slope in the plan. And again, I submitted a public document filed with the Public Utilities Commission that states we will not build on any slopes. We will share that information with the town and with uh, the, the binders as well. Anyone that wants to, to see it. And again, the Public Utilities Commission will enforce that. So uh, there have been a couple comments that our word is worth nothing. Uh, feel what you may, but the Public Utilities Commission word is something, they have the enforcing authority here, and it's a condition of a certificate of public good. Contrary to, to what Ms. Singledean had mentioned, if it's a condition of the CPG, and we put it in there voluntarily to make sure that it's there, the Public Utilities Commission is not going to override that. That will be a condition of the permit. Um, so I, I'm just trying to keep it to the facts that are here which is we've agreed not to, and we don't want to build it on slopes greater than 25 degrees. Uh, and it is in the record with the Public Utilities Commission who is the enforcer at the end of the day. Why can't you have your engineers put out a site plan that's accurate for that site? Great, great question. This typically goes through a process of land survey and work that is done post the completion of the permitting process. So you do your best effort, like most of these processes are, to say this is what it's going to be. We have a very defined limits of disturbance that we will stay within, so we're not gonna capriciously move the array, but it, should it violate through that very on the ground survey process, 25 degrees, we won't construct there, as we lined out as a condition of the public utilities commission. Okay, so to stop some of the back and forth there and get back to the board getting the facts, we don't have anyone on tonight that can help the board understand what took place from the perspective of the planning commission and what helped them. What we've got is other people's in interpretation of what made them come to that conclusion. But if I understand correctly, we have nobody with us tonight that can help from their perspective or can tell us what they sought for legal opinions and what those were. Is that correct? I could I could probably speak to the legal opinion. 
just because I ended up in the in-between with Mike Karen you can summarize the two questions that were asked were could you rescind a letter and if so I mean and then the sub question of if so how and whether or not that opens up any liabilities and the response from Mike was essentially yes it's likely that you can there isn't a lot of process or precedent around that type of action so it's not necessarily clearly spelled out how you go about it um, or how it all fits together it's unlikely in that interpretation to create some set of undue liabilities, but again, without much of the precedent, there's still a little bit of un unknown in there. There's no obvious um, Achilles heel, though, at least from that kind of cursory glance. So the opinion was focused on those two areas based on the conversation everybody attended at the Planning Commission meeting. So that was, that was the attorney's role and the questions that were asked to him um, specifically about that. Could you just say that again? And his opinion was that you probably could rescind it. Yeah, so he looked into else. it, and that's where it's it's one of the, I think it's nine ways for a project to achieve the preferred siting designation. There isn't much process or any process and even really any precedent about what happens or how you rescind a letter. It does seem likely based on what there is that you can. I mean, if you've extended the, uh, uh, the letter of support, so to speak, you could at some point pull that back if there were some change in circumstances. How you do it, what it looks like, that would be the question. It's probably a simple letter in return. Um, and then whether or not that opens up any liabilities, there isn't anything that's obvious. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't be something that somebody would bring up or that would occur or that we don't can't foresee at this moment, but there wasn't anything that sort of popped up as a, if you do this, then be ready for that kind of a, if, if I can make a suggestion, I mean, the town can certainly file a, a supplemental letter or a comment with the Public Utilities Commission that said, you know, we filed this letter based on the fact that no no uh, array will be built on Post Road in 25 years. Okay, so oh, that's, hey, hang on, Brooke, just a second. That's something that our legal counsel would have to guide us, not, and we don't have them here with us tonight. I think Tim had his hand up first and then Brooke. Okay. Hello? Am I coming through okay? Yes, ah. you are. Okay, cool. I just have a quick clarifying question. Um, Jim's been talking about a 25 degree angle and the town plan talks about a 25% angle and those are two different things. Uh, 25 degrees is about a 50% grade. So I'm just curious, are we talking about the same thing or two different values here? Uh, my mistake. We're, we're talking about the same thing. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Rick? I think Perry's on the, on the line and he was at, on the planning commission and was there and was privy to all these emails. Perhaps he could speak to what happened. Well, I could, I think what I'm gonna do is I think that uh, truthfully here, um, my interpretation of what you're referring to is a little different than my interpretation of it. So I'm not gonna get in the weeds here about the differences that I believed I heard. Um, so <clears throat> that's where I'm gonna leave it. Could I ask Jim a question? Um, yep, go ahead. Will the Public Utilities Board or whatever, will they require that you do a map showing exactly where the panels are? And yeah, whether... we'll go through a series of required filings, which would be uh, aesthetics, natural resources, um, electrical feasibility, so there's a whole series of studies. And in that would be um, maps in particular because we've made it a condition about the slopes we will have to show some level of we'll have to show compliance uh, with that and it'll be follow-up compliance to make sure that after we build it we did not violate from what we said we would do and we would be subject to losing our certificate of public goods should we violate the conditions of our um, of the application so you will have to submit an, accurate, an accurate site plan 
we're we're going to have to submit something to comply with what we stipulated to the Public Utilities Commission. What exactly they're going to want, um, I don't know, but we will have to, in some manner, comply with being able to verify that we did not install on slopes um, that we said we would not exceed. So yes, is the short answer. So if you did that now and resubmitted based on that, would that work? Um, uh, the way it would work with the Public Utilities Commission is if we say that we're not going to do it, we have to comply with that or else we face significant um, financial and uh, penalties uh, from them. and everything that we would have done would be lost. So they don't actually say, show me that, that you're not going to do that, because they know they have the ultimate enforcement power, that if we don't do it, they can tell us this all has to be removed. And so um, we will have to show them that we complied, but they don't have to see it ahead of time because they have the enforcement power to make sure that we do comply. I don't know if I'm being clear with you, it's just the way that they operate. Yeah, I understand. If they specifically okay. did have a request, though, show me this, we, we would comply. There's many different ways that they may interact on this point, but we don't know what the Public Utilities Commission will choose as their mechanism of enforcement. But ultimately, they do have that. They are the enforcer of making sure we don't do it. Wouldn't everybody be better off if there was a plan that was oh, accurate? for sure. Before we go in, we're going to have a, a have it surveyed on the ground to make sure that we do not have um, any any array installed on the slopes. For us, the importance is the limits of disturbance, and that's what the Public Utilities Commission is looking at. So we have to stay within that disturbance area. If some of that disturbed area is a slope of greater than 25 percent, sorry to get that right, we can't build there. And it could potentially be a smaller array. But from the Public Utilities Commission, from the ANR report, Agency of Natural Resources report, everything that's filed. Oh, I'm using them both. They're looking at that sorry. circle of disturbance. And that's what they're looking at. And we've added this extra stipulation that we will not build on any area within that specified designated mm -hmm. area. It has a slope of 25%. I don't know if I'm answering your question. This Sorry. part of the process sets the boundaries, and then at some subsequent point, you set the details. Is that maybe any What's that? The limits of yeah, the is. is setting is really the specific area they're looking at. There is, they allow some movement within that disturbed area, limits of disturbance, to to uh, site the array. So as you get on site, you will learn things physically by being there. You know, there could be a large boulder that was never seen or something like that that you might adjust around. But we have to stay within the designated area that we said we would operate within. And we've added this extra stipulation to ensure that we don't do work on slopes of 25 to, sorry, percent uh, as well. So that's how we, and we would determine that right off the bat when we get there, is we would do a land survey to site and lay out the array the best we could within the limits of disturbance, which is what all of the reports are being done on. So the limits of disturbance is actually larger than the physical space the array would take. And then maybe to try to reframe Pat's question, if I can maybe yeah. then. Because you're going to have to do the second piece anyway, doesn't it make sense to do it all before you go through a regulatory framework? Is that what I maybe kind of what I was okay. saying? Um, generally, uh, we go through the regulatory framework, and it's it's smooth, and you put this towards the end because you don't know what stipulations might come out of the Public Utilities Commission process. Okay. So, Agency of Natural Resources could say you know, we actually want you to move the array here. So we don't know precisely where. We've given a designated area where we think it is, but there's many parties, including parties here in this room, that can have influence on the Public Utilities Commission to say, we want it done a certain way. 
So based yeah. on that, it gets hard to get down to specifics of where you're going to cite something because most likely it can change a little bit. It would be very easy to get to specifics if you had the survey done first. Then you would know exactly what you have. You would know how large your array is. Your engineers could plot it all out. And the Public Utilities Commission would have something that's accurate to look at. But it sounds like there might be other variables. That's a variable or a set of variables, but you're saying there could be other variables based on regulatory review from that the agency. Multiple level parties level. look at this process. Okay. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, we bear the risk that if it does get smaller because of uh, slope or any of those other constraints, we bear that risk. And if we've decided, oh, to make it bigger, we need to go out of the limits of disturbance, that starts the whole process over again. Um, so I don't know if I answered. Okay, we have a couple of people with hands up. Um, first is Brendan. Just wanted to say good evening and um, some of this discussion referred to interactions that I myself personally have had with the uh, select board, the planning commission, and some of the folks you know, attending here tonight. So I just wanted to say hello and, uh, uh, and to say, as, as we have um, said it many times, both in public meetings as well as uh, you know, directly to folks, it's our desire to work with folks in the community to make it possible for the most number of folks in Vermont to take advantage of renewable energy. Um, it was me personally um, who presented this project to the Select Board and the Planning Commission, and I did so in good faith, and that is the, uh, the manner that I continue to work with the town. And as some of you know, um, I am also a direct neighbor to this project. So, uh, you know, I have, uh, I have every interest in um, care for the town and, uh, and care for the property. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, Larry? Yeah, I, I'd like to, to say that I, <clears throat> I also think that, um, that, that Brendan and Jim are, are working through this project in good faith. Um, and I would really, you know, we approved this project um, based upon what we saw. Um, now knowing that some of the, the panels in the original plan could have been cited on slopes which are, are greater than 25 um, degrees. We, or was it percent? Percent, I'm sorry. Um, we, 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 it, see, it, it seems really clear that um, no one wants um, anything to be put on slope, slopes that are that steep. Um, um, and Jim presented um, evidence that indeed there are not going to do that. Um, I'm not sure what we gain by rescinding a letter, although I do agree that the process at, at best was flawed and at worst, um, there has been illegal with some of the open meeting law violations, which have been indicated. I'd love to learn more about that at some future date. And if we are having problem in, in our town with open meeting laws being followed, um, we need to take that very seriously and make sure that everybody, all our committees are well-versed in what needs to happen to comply with open meeting laws. Um, it seems to me that what we could do at this point would be to, um, and, and maybe we can't do that at, at, at this meeting because it's not warned. Perhaps we can do this at um, our meeting on the 22nd, um, would be to um, um, make a, an amendment to our letter simply stating that you know that that any panels must be on you know slopes of less than 25 percent um, for it to um, be a preferred site for us and and that way we would um, become compliant with the town plan Thank you All right um, Brooke. You're muted, Brooke. Can 
right. Maybe she's going to have technical. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. okay, sorry. I was trying to look up the town plan language. Sorry, that's why I couldn't get back to the unmute button. So um, there seems to be this notion that by just not putting these panels themselves on the steep slopes that somehow that manages to clear the town plan. And um, you know, it does talk about energy facility development shall have to meet principal structure setback for the relevant area in the town zoning and shall be prohibited in floodways class one and two wetlands, lands within 50 feet of the top of bank of perennial streams, lands over 25% slope. So energy facility development shall have to meet. The development cannot be on a 25% slope is the law that was enacted by you folks. Just putting the solar panels, you know, actually not on that does not remit, does not pass muster. You also have to deal with the access road, which appears to be on very steep slopes throughout most of what I have seen from mapping of this. And so, <laughs> This notion that somehow we're not going to, you know, put the big foot or the cement, uh, you know, pylon down into some area where there's 25% slopes, you've got to drive all the trucks all over these areas. You got to take the panels up there. You got to use the excavators. You got to disturb all the area. So when Jim is talking about the disturbed area, the disturbed area is what can't be on 25% slopes. And what? just because you're going to try to avoid putting actual array, a panel itself on the 25% slope, how is that going to work? That's why a site plan needs to be given to the town. The town, what does the town have to gain, Larry, to rescind this letter? What they have to protect is to protect the town plan. Your law that you enacted says this, and just like Petrini was concerned earlier about precedent and rules have to apply to everybody, you have a prohibited locations provision that is as plain as the letters, the black letter law here. And you are needing to rescind this because the lands are over 25% slope that, that are the energy facility development. Now, precedent is important. Your only job here is not to listen to what's going to happen at the PUC and we're going to promise them this or that. The only job that you have in this ro in the role of, of the PUC preferred sites determination is, should you give this person a preferred sites letter? Not do you comply with the town plan? Do you comply with the town plan as a bare minimum? And is this a place where we should give you a fast forward, you know, speed pass to, to a permit because we think it's a really good place to have it. That's a more enhanced standard in my opinion, but at the bare minimum, you can't give a preferred sites letter for a prohibited location. Until unless there is a site plan that shows the disturbed area is not impacting slopes of 25% or more. And if they want to reconfigure the array and you guys think that's good enough and you don't care about the access road, fine, everyone coming down the pike from now on is going to know that in Randolph, it doesn't matter how steep a slope that you're building your access road on because there's no prohibition the town plan doesn't mean anything. That's what precedent is about. So I know Jim is a very smart fellow and he's doing his best to help to revive this, but I strongly recommend the town, one of these boards should do the right thing like Camden Walters voted to do and that's to rescind the letter. And if they want to come back to you guys and say, okay, now that you've rescinded it, we've changed things, fine. If they don't want to, they can go forward in their process at the PUC. You're not, it's not stopping them. They've already figured out we're going to give them a condition. And so maybe they'll say, okay, it doesn't matter that you violate the town plan because you're going to try to avoid actually putting in the panels where they shouldn't be. And that's good enough for us. Here's your permit. Please defend our law. Otherwise, don't enact it. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, Tom? Brooke has just um, 
Brooke has just asked the question that I was going to ask, um, and it's relative to the access row. We've been focused on the siting of the solar arrays, but we haven't really addressed the question of the access road. And I'm wondering if in its um, communications with the PUC, if, uh, if Norwich intends to um, commit to not putting the access road on a, a slope of 25% or, or more. So I can speak in a limited fashion and, uh, you know, certainly, um, especially um, given the uh, uh, the nature of the uh, analysis of how I have spoken in the past, you'll forgive me if I'm careful. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, there may be some honest differences in interpretation here. So that, that may be the case. Another element is that the state process um, in terms of slopes and in terms of the management of uh, impact of stormwater, um, that process goes through the state stormwater permit. Um, and there are different levels of stormwater permits. Um, the all of these projects, all of these uh, Vermont 500 projects apply for and receive a state stormwater permit that addresses uh, all of these, uh, as far as I know, <laughs> being careful, all of these issues in terms of um, uh, managing uh, the development and its impact on the landscape and, um, and how not just how access will be gained, but where will there be a laydown area and where will the vehicles park? So um, these, these issues are considered. Um, there is, and now I have to preface this, I'm speaking based on my personal experience on other solar projects. Um, there is a preference for using existing access uh, as opposed to putting in new access. This particular, pro this particular property has several uh, existing uh, access ways, we would call them. So, um, and, and they go back many years. Some have been used more recently for logging, but they predate the logging. And so uh, there's often a preference for using an existing access way rather than uh, installing a new access way. Uh, and I believe that that would be the case here. One of the existing access ways was selected and shown on the site plan that was submitted. So, um, and then when you make that choice of using the, existed, the existing access way, uh, then the stormwater permit um, where we used a, a licensed engineering firm uh, to uh, uh, make the plans and then we submit them uh, uh, for review and approval. Um, we'll govern things like runoff areas, whether you need level spreaders or whether you need um, any number of other uh, stormwater management um, uh, uh, approaches implemented uh, on the site. So. That's the best answer I can give you with the you know, limited understanding I have. Okay, so we have um, any further questions or thoughts on how to proceed with this from the board? Michael wants to respond to the last statement. Okay, just one second, Pat. It feels like we're missing the whole side or uh, any information from the actual planning commission uh, and the town attorney. Those are the pieces that feel like they're missing for me anyway. Um, <clears throat> well, 
move somebody in the town offices. That, oh, hang on, Tom. Okay. All we have from the planning commission is the letter that was sent to the binders announcing the rescission of their previous decision to um, to rescind the letter, the rescinding of the rescinding. Um, that's the only thing we have from the planning commission. Um, I, I just have to say that, and I'm, I'm entirely supportive of this project. I'm entirely supportive of the of the spirit of this project and its intent. I do have a concern, um, and it's almost an overarching one about the potential violation of open meeting uh, laws here in the way this decision was made. It's not whether I agree with the decision or not, it's how the decision was made that could be problematic. I have no doubt and, and, and have every, every reason to believe that, that Norwich will act in good faith and go through with what they're saying they are willing to do, but good faith and the letter of the law are two different things. And um, uh, that's a little Listen, bit- wait, can I weigh in here for a second? Yeah. There, there was no violation of open meeting laws when we made the decision to grant this request. Okay, so I don't know where that came from. All right, um, but that's totally a falsehood. So if anybody thinks that that was the case, um, I'm more than happy to have that conversation in private here uh, with Trevor so that he can share that information with you folks. Okay, but there was no violation of open meeting laws when this decision was brought to the town. I don't think that's what's being implied here. I'd love to know what's being implied. Uh, so well, that's, that's that's where I'm at on this. I, I think I'm going to stop right there. Right. But Harry, let me just ask you, the suggestion has been made that the decision was made via email. Is that accurate or not? No, this decision was not made by email. When we originally granted the permission, when we said we would give them a letter of support, that was happened in a meeting. OK, where you know, there was public input. And, oh, yeah, you know, no. that. So yeah. that's not the case here. I'm not sure what's being implied here that we violated some open meeting laws, but I would certainly love to see how that happened because I am not aware of that until tonight. So that's why I'm not commenting about this until I get that information. Tom, let me just jump in. We're not talking anything about the original, I don't even know when it was. Oh, right, I, I, I realize that. Yeah, this is about what happened in December 14th by email. December 13th, 14th, 15th, 2021, to rescind, they had decided to rescind the decision, but needed to make sure they weren't going to get sued. They didn't wait for the lawyer's decision. They decided by email to not rescind after, after talking, Sonny talked with the applicant and got some other explanations and ways to try to smooth it over. And they all decided, except for Camden, to reverse what they told everybody in public, but they did it all by email. So I'm happy to send you what the FOIA request provided, but I think the town administrator has that because he must have produced it. And I would urge the select board to review the conversations to determine whether you think that that's the way the town should be doing business. Okay, so before we go down that rabbit hole too far, I think we're at a disadvantage because we haven't seen any of this. I haven't, unless somebody else has. Um, so I'm a little nervous that we have a lot of things at play and we have nobody here, again, I will say it, from the Planning Commission, from the perspective of Sunny or whoever led that whole process to give us their side of what took place and, and what happened. And I just, I don't... I mean, I'm going to leave it. Well, up you, training. But training. Time, Brooke, wait, 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 Brooke. Just a second. Um, I think it's up to board members how you want to proceed with this. If you feel like you have the information you need, or do you feel like you need the other side of the story? Um, <sighs> The concern seems to be that the, 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 the horse is already out of the barn and this is moving towards the PUC. And if we take another 
we can even if we were to bring this up again at our meeting a week from Saturday. Um, I, I'm just questioning the timeliness of how imperative it is that we make this decision tonight, or if we delay it for another eight days, 10 days, whatever it is, um, uh, can we take those eight to 10 days to gather all the information we really need to make a, um, a reasoned decision and then make it then rather than tonight? Uh, without, without opening the door for, I don't know when the PUC, I, I missed earlier when, when the question was asked when the PUC process is actually going to start uh, happening. If somebody could clarify the timeline on that, it might. We don't have a date, we don't have a date yet. Is it likely to happen before February 11th, say? Hard to say, but. Um, we, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Still, the first thing they have to do is schedule a meeting in order to schedule the actual hearing. And, um, yeah, that's... you know, with COVID and everything else, and uh, it, it's hard to predict. Right. And, and part of why I'm asking that is that's your next regularly scheduled meeting. I don't want to get anybody crosswise, time wise, but I would really like to protect the morning of the 22nd to be about the budget, the capital plan, and town meeting, because those do have a time element. We cannot miss at the end of right. January. So we, we yeah, need yeah. to complete that work. And so whatever you do, if we can block that off and figure out the time around or other than, I would recommend that. Can I get in a word? Just rel respond to Brenda Nelly and a couple other points. Um, you there's uh, been request to know what happened at the planning board meeting. Uh, Joan and I have spent a lot of time listening to the recording of that meeting and transcribing it. And we have filed an affidavit at the Public Utilities Commission that contains a number of quotes of the Planning Commission members to give a sense for what was going on there. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through this and read this all now. Um, I don't but think so. It's certainly in the public record now. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for the offer, Michael. But I. I just feel like there's so much here and there's one whole part of the pie not here tonight to talk about what took place um, that there needs to be some type of input here from them and even from the town's legal counsel on what where we're at and what we need to do. Well, I have a I have a copy here of the town's legal opinion on this, which which uh, Trevor already mentioned, saying, yes, you can rescind, and there's not going to be any liability that he can think of. So that's been done already, and I'm sure you could have a copy if it's not in your packet. Um, I could hold it up to the screen right now for you to see if you'd like. Uh, and like I said, we have an affidavit of our transcriptions of that meeting. And of course, the recording of the meeting is public record. You're welcome to listen to it and hear every nuance of what happened there. Uh, as far as Brendan's... Uh, issue earlier that he mentioned that the Public Utilities Commission will be responsible for making sure that uh, stormwater regulations and so forth are passed and so uh, right. that's fine and I'm really glad the Public Utility Commission will do that but uh, that's not the job of the select board to decide about stormwater runoff your job is just to see does it meet the town plan what has been submitted to you and I don't think it does and I think it needs to be rescinded and uh, let North Solar come back with a new plan uh, and we'll judge it on its merits. Okay, so thank you for explaining what our job is. I just feel like we don't have the full picture and the I don't know what questions were put to the attorney to figure out what a, that opinion was that was issued. If everybody else is comfortable that they have the full story and are ready to act, we can entertain motions and go through that. I'm just not convinced that we have everything that's needed to sort that out. Uh, thoughts from the board on how to proceed? I'd like to move that we, um, that we table this discussion uh, and consideration of rescinding the, uh, the, the letter to uh, our February 11th regular meeting. 
And during that period of time, uh, let's gather all the information we can from the planning commission, from the town attorney. And I particularly would like to see this question of whether the decisions that were made and communicated in the letters and emails that ran the time period from December 12th to December 14th, whether those decisions were made consistent and communications were consistent with open meeting laws. I, I hear you, Perry. I totally agree and understand that the previous meetings back in June were consistent with open meeting laws, no question about it. The question is, were the actions taken December 12th to 14th consistent with open meeting? Uh, so I, I'd like to see that question addressed. And But my motion is to table this till our next regular monthly meeting. <clears throat> I just like to say that I think there's more than one question to be answered here. One of them is whether we rescind the letter or not. Another one is the whole issue of uh, public information and doing everything according to the law. And the third part is our part in approving or not approving an application like this and should we have some criteria by which we do that okay so before we go there pat we have a motion waiting for a second the table to table it and get more information does that work for everybody is that for the two parties well we're not up for discussion yet. <laughs> you want to follow process, Pat? We got to follow process. I have a motion and it needs a second for discussion. I will second it for the purpose of discussion. Okay. Now you have questions on it? Yeah, Trevor asked this before, and I think the answer was that. The 11th will probably be soon enough, but I just wanted to ask that question again, make sure what the answer is. And if I can piggyback on it, how much notice do you generally get before you're called back to the PUC? So you may not know right now, but how far back from when they let you know do they? Well, the scheduling meeting you know? would be all the parties would have to agree on a specific date, is what I understand. So you could always say that the date will be after. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, so discussion. I, I would love to understand. Uh, I think uh, Patrick did a nice job, but there's, there's multiple threads here. Uh, I came here under the understanding uh, that this was a discussion about scopes and the select board removing their preferred letter based upon uh, slopes. And now it sounds like this is a, a, a multifaceted um, discussion. I'm just trying to understand the scope. So for the next, uh, for the 11th meeting or the next meeting, will it be actually warned what those threads are or just so that we understand what the, the different angles this is going to the best of your ability? Well, okay, I, uh, so the issue that involves you about the slope and whether it meets the town plan is the important issue we need to deal with. But I think there are a couple others that we need to deal with at some point in public information and our part in approving this without having any criteria by which we're approving it. Okay, so uh, what the criteria is we're approving it by and whatnot came up when we issued the letter, Pat. And so I think what we have on the table here is a discussion of whether we, what we, what we need at our next meeting to be able to evaluate this and make a decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not disagreeing uh, with that. I'm just saying there's more than that issue that we need to look at. Well, yeah, I think there are multiple threads. We're all in agreement on that. Um, and I, I think you and Trini are on the same page. Um, but the, the reality is that the facts are that we don't have all the information at hand to make a judicious decision tonight, I don't think. 
So, and that's the, that's the spirit behind my motion. All right, so we have a motion on the table on to table this, get more information and bring it to our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll call the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Aye. Or abstained, whatever it has to be. <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> motion carries. It would be nice if we could have representation from the planning commission and get some of these questions to the town attorney and get some more information before everybody has to come back and make a decision. And Next on the to... agenda, as we're pretty early on in the agenda tonight and it's moving right along in time is Green Mountain Powers line upgrade on Pleasant Street. Um, so I can kick this one off because I was involved in it some. Green Mountain Power has started their line upgrade down Beanville Road, Pleasant Street, down to the fire station. Uh, in starting some of their drilling, they ran into some communication lines and some fun things. So they've had to go to a back truck uh, with high pressure water to clean the holes out to make room to put the... Um, holes in. In doing this, they had to move a little bit the location of the line. Um, in the original plan they submitted to us, they showed that the trees by the cemetery were at risk, uh, but they tried to save them. They're not going to be able to. They need to remove them to be able to bring the poles down through there. Uh, in having the discussions with them, we weren't sure that it was very specific of what came before the board that those trees would be removed. So we wanted to bring it back before the board to make sure everybody understood that. Uh, and there were no concerns before we just said, go ahead and remove them. So you'll see, I think there's three trees by the cemetery. Um, they're gonna be in the way of that power line going in. Uh, and this was brought back to the board just to make sure everybody was on the same page and clear about what that looked like. I think those trees have already been removed, haven't they? Yep. They're down. Trevor? A little bit late. <laughs> I think that happened yeah. yesterday. It happened, all right, well, I think Kevin and I are gonna have a different conversation tomorrow then. But it was pretty clear that we were going to check in. They had been discussed in broad strokes as part of a site visit, but it hadn't necessarily been discussed or considered as part of some of the original approvals. The approvals had focused on those trees that were, um, you know, had the leafier crowns that were closer to the central part of that cemetery. And then a few on the Beanville Road sort of ended it where the telephone lines right now kind of cut through. Um, so a couple of those older maples might either have to be trimmed or removed. We had left it that we were going to double check and verify. And then if you did offer your blessing, then they would be fully good to go. So if they've acted already, they are certainly ahead of the curve with that. And I hadn't, I had not heard that. I thought we were in alignment. <laughs> so my apologies there. Well, no, that was the that was the understanding. Uh, the exchange with him, it was very clear that we were meeting tonight, we would bring it to the board tonight to make sure that everybody realized on the plan, those were identified. Um, so you weren't the only one. <laughs> All the ones you see up by the road anyway are gone. Oh, well, they're still, some of them are still there, but they're on the ground. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I guess at this point, there's no action to take until we know yeah. what happened, right? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll follow up with Green Mountain Power. All right. So next up on the agenda is to consider appointing members to ARPA. You've got a list in your packet of folks who have supplied their early emails of interest. Um, somebody who also we referenced to you, Gary Durr, had spoken that he was interested, sent a quick email, but it's not in the attachment that's in there. So I want to make sure that his name is not missed as you consider those. Who is that? Uh, Gary Durr. Yeah. And then um, you can, we've got a few of them on now. I don't know that when I looked a little while ago, they were. And we had all of them on. If you had any you had questions for, um, things you could do is point right now, or you could discuss candidates later in executive session under the, the personnel moniker, and then make appointments when you exit there. Um, you have six slots. Really, when you think about it, one of the slots is set aside to be a select board member who would chair the ARPA committee, um, and then the other six members because it was seven member committee upon your adoption of the scope of work I think in let's say we did that in November um, we would do that and then we had tried to do it with an eye towards some geographic representation uh, but I think after uh, we've been out there and advertised for candidates over the course of two months and as exciting an opportunity as this is um, and, the numbers we have are the numbers we have. So we're very grateful to have them. Um, but, but I don't suspect that going much longer will we'll shake much more. And it's work we can get going on. It, it, and it's timely in terms of the final rule which is published by the United States Treasury Department. It looks at first blush like we're going to have a little more flexibility in how we use the money. The LCT's guidance when I checked this afternoon on their website was um, in bold print, something to the effect of just hang on for a second if you can, you know, um, so that they can digest the 500 and something page rule and figure out um, exactly what's in there and how it differs from the interim guidance. It was in the interim guidance that we had the very specific categories. Um, it seems like with the final rule, especially under the lost revenue provision, there may be the opportunity to use that category more broadly um, without any of the um, you know, equations to prove what your losses were at different points to, to what amount up to a maximum we might have a lot more flexibility to be able to use that. Um, but that's they're analyzing that. We'll keep an eye on, on the informational sources and reach out to the, uh, we've got a, a dedicated ARPA coordinator there that we can connect with um, at any point as well. So it, it's evolving. Like I said, we've got about two years to obligate the funds, um, four years to spend them. And we've set this committee up so that it would be um, fairly finite in scope. It's got a task list and it's got a time. And right now that time sort of expires at the end of April. So we also wanna make sure they have enough time to do their work too as we go through it and then can make any decisions on extensions or, or additions if we need them. Okay, so... Um... We have a list of candidates that was in the packet. I will say I like how um, Jeff Grout addressed his. <laughs> so he sent it to the one in um, charge. <laughs> yeah, uh, the only candidate that um, I'm a little bit concerned with on this list is uh, Ramsey, because I believe she's the one that didn't show up at the budget meetings and folks were really struggling with non-participation there. Trini, what budget meetings are you referring to? She was on the budget committee for a while and wasn't showing up and um, they kept coming, talking about how they couldn't get a quorum and... Or and uh, are you sure? I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't recall Ramsey being on the budget committee since I've been on the select board. I'm pretty sure that she was the one that. I don't know how to look it up right now, but 
there we had we did have another member of the budget committee who who I would agree also often did not show up but I, I wonder if you're confusing the two people I don't remember Ramsey being on the budget committee yeah, my, my recollection is that um, Ramsey is our representative to Two Rivers, but not, I don't recall her ever being on the budget committee, at least not in my two years on the select board. Okay. That's possible. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I know that she's a Two Rivers rep, but I'm not sure about the budget committee. Anybody have any thoughts on other folks that came forward? This isn't, uh, we're looking at filling five positions, right? We've got, yeah, well, yeah six. Um, you need a board member, so seven when you consider that. But there'd be oh, six. okay. I, I wasn't clear as to whether the board member was the sixth or the seventh. Okay. Yeah. And, so, and then you've got seven candidates for the other six slots. I'll make the motion that we appoint the six people that are numbered one through six. I'd second that. Uh, just for discussion beforehand, did we look at, um, did you say you looked at geography, Trevor? Or this is just all that came forward? Yeah, we we put that out there with this with the thought that we would try to provide at least three slots that were aimed specifically at you know village center east, um, but the seven candidates that set forward were the the that's the whole shoot and match. So to the extent there's any geographic dis, uh, dispersion in there, um, it's you know, it is what it is. And and with some of the names, I couldn't off the top of my head tell you. I, don't, I, don't, I know where Ramsey lives and that's about it. <laughs> we have one that says she lives on Partridge Hill. Right, Maria. And Jeff lives near there. And, Kim, where's Jeff live? <laughs> and Matt, Matt Morowski lives on Beanville Road. Okay. Michael Abadi lives on um, at the at the end of uh, School Street Extension at the Airbrook Road, in that air, right on, not long before. Oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Tree. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know where Mary lives. Archer Hill. Okay, so 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 all these all these folks are on the on the west side of town. Beanville's not. Yeah, right. Oh. We didn't get anybody from the center even. No one we posted it twice on Coach Forum. Yeah, we went out a couple of different times in a couple of different places and, and, and it does seem to be west side uh, heavy. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Pat said it's a west side story at this point. <laughs> Yeah, that is concerned about that. I don't, you know. Well, this this is an advisory body, correct? It doesn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's making. It's going to do the some of the review and make some recommendations and provide some, you know, an analysis of, of what's possible, I suppose, with, with the ARPA funds back to the select board. Um, mm -hmm. so we'll do that advisory capacity and then, and then you'll still have the policy prerogative there at the end of the day. People from other areas can come to meetings and give their input. Yeah, yeah, everything will yeah. be open, warned in accordance with the public meeting level. Right. We'll even Probably set aside a little ARPA section somewhere on the on the website. 
another so section I, on how to get to the ARPA section? It, uh, other than the lack of geographic variability, it, it, I mean, it does seem like a good group of folks. I mean. Yes, it does. There's no question about it. It's just that, and I live in the village, right? In the heart of the village, but it, it is a little bit concerning as Trini suggests that the voice of people from the center in East Randolph isn't represented here unless one of our select board members steps up from that area to chair and, and serves as that voice. <laughs> uh, hi, Trini. <laughs> Who might that be? Uh, hmm. uh, what idea was that? <laughs> I have a lot going on, guys. Oh. Yeah, I know. I, I know. Uh, what do you think the time commitment is for this? I'm hopeful that uh, in terms of actual meeting time, the, the rules are clarified. BLCT does most of the heavy lifting, say, and breaking it down, and we can get some help there. Um, anywhere from four to six meetings, an hour and a half to two hours maximum. And then staff will probably do, you know, putting together packets, agendas, postings, and then trying to synthesize right up whatever comes out of it, and then coordinating reviews. So um, you'll have some other pieces as part of this as a committee member, but. Um, we'll try to keep it limited to that 10 to 15 hour framework, say, in terms of meeting and review time to the extent possible. Do you think we'd be uh, done our little task here by, say, the 1st of June? I think that's certainly the goal. Yeah, we were hoping for a little earlier, but we're going to try to, um, if we needed a little more time, we could. It, if the, with the final rule done, and once that's broken out, that should smooth the pathway. When we set the committee up, it was still unclear what that timeline was going to look like, but now that we know the rules of the game, it should be a little easier. Okay. Well, I would uh, volunteer to be the select board chair member as long as we can complete the process by 1st of June. If not, then somebody else is going to have to step in to finish that up. To help you out, Perry, if it's not done by June, I will step up and complete the term, but you better be done by June. <laughs> well, that would be yeah. my goal. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it personally shouldn't last much longer than that anyways, but I know how these things can go, so. Yeah, this looks like a pretty solid group that you're not going to hopefully have to do a lot of herding of cats with, so. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, you've got, yeah. you got a good group of people there, yeah. so. Yeah, and it doesn't look like, I mean, I, I don't know all of these people well. I know them sort of, you know, um, superficially, but I, I don't see anybody here that looks like they would have some kind of overarching agenda of their own, um, which would be a fly in the ointment for getting done by June, but. Um, yeah, I think it probably could be done by June. That'd be my goal. All right, so we have a motion to elect the six that have put in interest letters and a second with Perry chairing it. That's not part of the motion, that's just a different one. But um, so all those in favor of appointing the six? Aye. 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 Um, opposed, abstained, motion carries. Do we need a motion to appoint Perry or he just is special? Mm. We know he's special. We're pretty special, yeah, I'm pretty special, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I think you should just make a motion and be done with it and that way it's official. I'll, I'll move that we appoint Perry the chair of this committee. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Kudos. 
Thanks for taking this on, Perry. Uh, you're welcome. I don't think it's that hard a task. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor's going to back me up with a lot of good information, right, Trevor? Right, 120 page packets coming your way on the <laughs> That's That's what I thought. <laughs> Gonna make those plane rides fly by in a hurry. Yeah, that's exactly. So you better get it to me before tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh boy. All right. Next we have town meeting Australian ballot or floor. We just wanted to bring this up so you could at least start thinking about it. The legislature has enabled um, the same option essentially as last year. Um, started in the Senate, went through the House. I didn't get a chance to check today to see if the governor had signed it. That was the last step as of when we wrote the, um, the agenda notes. Um, really, it's just giving the town the option um, should COVID concerns, especially with increasing case counts, hospitalizations, all of those things. Um, if there's some worry about town meeting, level of exposure, level of turnout, those things, you can go by Australian ballot essentially the same setup as last year. Informational hearing is required. I think no more than 10 days prior. Last year, we did it a week out of town meeting um, and, uh, and could buttress it with other informational or, or, or access points. Obviously, once you warn uh, town meeting and the Australian ballot setup, there's nothing you can do to adjust any of the budget numbers or anything that would be a poor vote, for example. Um, the other thing the bill does allow the capability to do is to move the town meeting date to presumably a warmer weather one for one. These are all one year um, actions, so they wouldn't have any lingering effect or consequence is to move town meeting to a warmer date. The idea being that um, you know, wherever COVID uh, uh, caseloads and other things are at that point, we'd be able to meet outside in those scenarios, a little bit more spacing, not have any sort of ventilation concerns or any of those pieces. So you do have the two options, knowing that we're you know, 10 of eight here, it might just be one of those things to think about. And this might be one that fits in well with that conversation on the 22nd, if you want, in terms of we'll know whether or not it's uh, been fully enacted. But just to get you thinking about it, in large part, because if we do, it might adjust timelines a, a little bit, um, as opposed to right now we're queued up to um, I think if the draft warning is written in a way, um, yeah, it's written so that um, much like last year's with the Australian ballot thing, if you want to go with the floor, we can, we can change that pretty quickly so that there's the Saturday town meeting and then anything that would be by Australian ballot would be the, the Tuesday, March 1st. I don't know if there are any thoughts or if you just want to chew on it a little bit and come back to it. I think everybody had hoped after last year we'd be back to normal. Um, for town meeting this year, but it's nice to have the options. I'll say that. Um, I, I'd like to ask if, if Emery has any, um, from, a, from the clerk's perspective, if you have any reflection on this. And I'm also, I mean, when this, when this all came up in 2020, and I know it was relative to the general election uh, and the primary in August, but, um, has there been, and maybe Larry, you can talk about this. Has there been any discussion at um, the state level about waiving any of the petition requirements for candidates for public office or for um, ballot questions? Yes. yes. <laughs> ah, all right, good. And what, what is, who, who wants to take that one? <laughs> uh, the, the legislature, in fact, the House, the Senate, um, I think it was yesterday in the House today, um, passed a bill that um, that ob that uh, obviates the need for signatures for um, for candidates running for um, um, positions for town meeting day elections. Okay. So so select board members, for instance, who are up for re-election this year do not need to collect signatures. Um, this bill, I believe, still needs to be signed by the governor, but um, it was. It, it passed the house i think it was either it was it was pretty much unanimous i think there was one dissenting voice vote mm -hmm. um, so i expect it will be signed into into law um shortly right. okay thank you 
I, I was wondering about because I read S172 um, in conjunction with, with uh, a meeting I was attending in Bridgewater the other evening uh, in my reporting role. And um, I noticed it didn't address that. Um, I, I believe this was S223. Okay. Yep. The dissenting vote, Larry, was probably somebody that had already got their names on the petition, right? Um, what was that, Pat? That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't hear you very well. The one person that voted against it might have been somebody that had already got all the names on their petition. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had a question um, for Trevor. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, it, you know, we don't have a lot that goes on um, that we vote on at town meeting in person. Um, it, in typical years, the, the one, this one sort of consistent big thing that we vote on is the, the membership of the budget committee. Um, and last year we did that by Australian ballot, which which seems appropriate given how we do all our other elected offices by Australian ballot. It seems like that makes sense anyway. And um, I'm wondering actually, now that I just, now that I'm thinking about it is, is if maybe we look into making that permanent um, in some sense, because all our other elected officers are, are all elected by Australian ballot. It seems like it makes sense for that one to be done the same way. But anyway, um, it's, it's nice to actually have an in-person town meeting for people to debate resolutions and the other handful of items that come up. Um, and so I'm, my question is, I'll get to my question. My question is, can we have an um, Australian ballot for the items that we would normally decide on town meeting day, but also have a delayed town meeting um, for say sometime in the spring where hopefully we will be passed you know, a, a time when we can't meet in person, or if we are, we could maybe have an alternative site outside where we could actually have a town meeting. Um, can we can we do both those things, or is it kind of a one or the other? It's more of a, a one or the other. If you go all Australian ballot, then you wouldn't need to move. You'd be doing that so you could keep the dates, avoid any COVID concerns and exposures. Um, and, and can you be conducting all the business that way? Because um, otherwise, if you delayed it, did it by Australian ballot, then you still, the only thing you're moving really is the informational hearing, which can be done remotely now anyway. It sort of envisions that you pair a remote informational hearing before the Australian ballot with the Australian ballot, so that way everybody can participate in some form from, from home or some other relatively safe vantage point. Whereas if you move it, it would be with the idea that we would do, you'd still have the, the things that have to go by Australian ballot or that would traditionally go. So the election of officers, but you'd be doing the rest of the floor stuff from that amended date. So it's sort of Australian ballot. It's either bit our traditional sort of town meeting, um, no changes an Australian ballot with the same date or an amended date that would still have both pieces, but the floor pieces would stay, you know, the budgets, any of those would still be from the floor at a later date, say May or something.
Right. Right. That's correct. So what? So if it's not a requirement, I think you just move all the issues to Australian ballot. I'm with Larry on that one. Me too. Okay, so we had a motion to do that. Uh, we did, didn't we, Larry? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Think, uh, that's what I thought it was, Larry, right? That was the motion, correct? That was the motion, of course. Yeah, of course it was. I seconded it. Yes, you did. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Motion carries. Next up is the draft town meeting warning. I would assume this has to hold out until the budget meeting. Yep. Yeah. The one. Week. The one piece we're waiting on are those final budget numbers, um, and once those are set, and we'll make sure that everything matches. We'll go back through and check the check the election officers too. Um, double check deadlines, but wanted to just. Again, get you thinking about it. It's January 13th, and we've got till January 30th, so we're we just want to make sure it's it's as front and center as possible. But no action mm -hmm. needed tonight. You'll do that once you once you've set budget numbers. We'll adjust it, take a look at it, and and, and have you do that. So it's hopeful maybe at the 22nd we'll be able to, to do that. All right. Sounds good. Next up is considering the library cupola grant <coughs> and restoration. Hi, this is Amy Blasnick. I'm the director of the library. And uh, for those of you who are more visually oriented, if you want to look at page 108 of the packet you received, I'm just going to go through these points quickly. Um, so there are actually two things at hand here. First is um, the great news that we did in the $20,000 grant from the Division for Historic Preservation to help pay for the repairs and restoration of the people of So I feel really great about that. Um, the other question has to do with whether the town will commit uh, $140,000 to make these repairs. Um, there were several questions at the previous board meeting. So I'm just going to run through these quickly. The first question was, does my proposal to do a bidding process that, uh, in which contractors are invited to examine the structure and then provide a, um, a plan and a bid does that comply with the town's procurement policy or purchasing policy? And yes, Trevor and I reviewed that policy and it the small category of requests for proposal where it's not possible to provide something like X number of items at X price. This is uh, a process that's used for the solicitation of professional and other services where qualitative judgments must be made. Another question that came up was, are there additional grant funds available? And I, I will modify what I wrote here and say, no, there aren't any available at the moment, but as always, I do keep my eyes open for opportunities. So it's certainly possible that I could find additional grant funds, but at this moment, there are no opportunities that I have found to help me for the historic preservation project. Amy, thank you for sending me the information about the ARPA funds that are flowing around. I'm sure you all are well aware of how tightly limited those funds are. What I did learn is there will be the energy efficiency project, and that's good news because the libraries, the ventilation and air conditioning systems need attention, and so hopefully some money can be found to do those projects, but we don't see anything for a historic preservation project like this right now. Another question that came up was um, how much has the town have the town taxpayers 
paid for capital improvements with the library. So I ran through the projects that have been done at the library from 2009 through 2021. And it's a total of just under $268,000. Um, about a quarter of that came from the taxpayers of the town. Um, 46% came from funds that the library trustees were able to provide, and 30% came from grant funds. Another question that came up had to do with the McNair money that the library was fortunate to receive a few years ago. The question was, is that money restricted? And the answer is no. Um, it was not restricted by Mr. McNair. The library trustees, however, did make strategic decisions about how that money should be used. So $100,000 of it has been kept for future needs. And the remaining is more or less because it's in the market. The amount changes, but anyway. Um, 50,000 was dedicated for building and the remaining 50,000 split between youth engagement and events in our beach. So the $40,000 that the library trustees are able to devote for the restoration of the cupola comes from the remaining amount of money that is left for building needs. Let's see. So, Shall I move on to the timeline for the group or are there questions that I can talk to about those points? I don't see anybody with questions. I have, I have one, Trini. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Are, are there several contractors that can do this type of work or is it very limited? I'm sure it's quite specialized. Um, the grant requirement is that we solicit three contractors to bid, but we don't have to get three bids, if that makes sense. So I'm absolutely invested in making sure that we get the right person for the job, um, which means you know, casting the net broadly. But I will also be able to advantage of guidance from the division and from the preservation trust to find the right people to invite. So in terms of the timeline, I have a grant acknowledgement for the need to return to the division of historic preservation by February 4th. It includes things like acknowledging the timeline that I'm going to go through. Um, uh, certificate of insurance, uh, yeah, it's a W-9, so it's kind of procedural. Um, the, the thing that I really like about this grant, that I appreciate about this grant, is they have very strict deadlines for each step of getting the project going. So February 4th is returning the grant management. March 4th is providing bid documents to the division for them to uh, Trevor also had some ideas about um, a structure that I can use to put together the bid documents. So again, thanks to Trevor for that. Um, by May 27th, I have to submit the winning bid uh, to the division for their approval. So it's very tight. <laughs> On June 30th, the complete uh, the grant agreement has to be completed. And then, unfortunately for me, I learned that the project has to be completed by December 31st of 2023, not December 31st of 2024, which is what the original email from the division said. So, sadly, I'm not getting as much time as I had hoped to get the project done. So that's the timeline. Any questions about that? So I guess at this point, I don't know that I have anything more to say other than that there are two questions I think you all need to act on. One of them is approving acceptance of the grant. 
and the other is committing $140,000 from town funds for the project. All right, uh, any questions from board members? So Trevor, what is sitting right now in the um, in the fund? In the facilities reserve? Yeah. I believe it's around 200. I In that 200 to 210 range. I'm trying to see if I have this sheet here with me. I think it's still upstairs, but that's what it was. Because we had highlighted that we didn't, unless there was, uh, it was 60 to $80,000 in other revenue that was forecast to come in um, in this fiscal year. And if we did that or achieved that money, we'd be able to fund the three projects that were in there, one of which was the repairs here to the skylight and some other things at Town Hall. And there was a third smaller project in that fifteen to twenty thousand dollar neighborhood that might have been also at the at the library or could have been in a different building. Um, but because of where we're at in fiscal twenty two, it's unlikely those projects would occur in this fiscal year. Anyway, even if that money didn't materialize and we plan ahead, we'll we'll likely be moving those post July one. Um, anyway, and also trying to make sure they're appropriately shaped and scoped out. So there is enough money in the reserve to do this. It doesn't fully deplete it, um, but we will have to, as we think about our facilities and as we complete some other projects that'll help us define future building projects, we probably will have to spend some time thinking about how to fund the facilities reserve the way that we've been funding some of the others. Um, so in the capital plan, we have other buildings that had needs that won't get any work done? Probably not in 22. They'll be pushed into 23 at this point. Some of that I think would happen just as a nature of the timing um, and the availability of contractors. Trying to get a copy of the capital plan in front of me here, it'll help. Okay, so there was there were eighty thousand dollars that were supposed to come in in addition to the what was projected to be in there. There was a transfer that went over of about seventy-five thousand dollars. And we were looking at projects in twenty-two that would have included um, the town hall office that I talked about before, and then there was a um, AC replacement or exterior painting project at the library. So there were three for 285. Um, but without that other $80,000, other receipts or grants, um, with just the facility reserve money, you wouldn't be able to do all three. But time-wise, the town office one is in, in fiscal 23 at this point anyway. My concern on this is if it wasn't the priority on the capital plan, does that mean if somebody else, like Randolph Center or um, probably not because we don't own that building, but uh, somebody else went out and got a grant for a small portion of their project, does that then jump them ahead of the other needs that we have that that funding is planned for? It, it could if we hadn't identified a project already. I think where this one has a little difference is that it's there's a $200,000 project in for fiscal 22 in that capital plan now. So if we certainly, if we took, you know, the East Randolph Hall out of the blue, uh, that would upset that priority apple cart. And th this one in past process had been put out here in fiscal 22 at some point. And some of it is until we complete the energy audits and go back through the capital plan. I mean, we, I, it goes back to what we talked about and getting ready for the infrastructure and ARPA and other funds that are out there. Is there's some basic project scoping that we need to do across categories and buildings is one of them in order to know what we want to do and then to be able to put them in priority order. Um, 
and so that we're both ready if opportunities come, and if not, that we're we're ready with our own funding and have, have put them in the right order, or the order that we want to want to move them forward in. Can I make a motion, Trini? Yeah. Is that yes? You can. Um, I would move that we accept the historic preservation grant and that we commit up to $140,000 in capital funds for the library cupola project. I'll second that. So just to clarify, does that come with um, any type of direction for them to continue looking for grants to pay for this? I'm just a little nervous that we're now shortchanging the work that we've talked about now for multiple years on the town hall in this too. Um, I, I think Amy has said that she'll keep looking. She said that again tonight. And Trevor, I'm sure, will be looking. I think this becomes a priority project because it is leaking at this point. Do you have any further discussion on this? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Now, um, I consider approving marketing and tourism grant agreement. Uh, Robin. Job. I would thank the select board on the, take the opportunity to thank the select board profusely on behalf of the board of trustees. You know, you put this stuff off on a really old building and it just costs more and more the longer you wait. And so we have an opportunity to fix it and we are grateful for the select board's support. Thanks again. Yep. Um, so marketing and tourism grant agreement. Josh? Hiya. Um, so this is, uh, this was a grant out of ACCD. Um, and I apologize, um, because this, th we've already applied for this grant. Um, it came together really quickly in November. Um, and um, I wasn't able to bring it to the uh, December uh, select boards uh, meeting because I was on vacation. Um, and so, you know, now we now we get to bring it to your attention um, with some good news because we, we got the grant. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a, a $30,000 $30, grant. Um, and, and so this program was designed um, one to, to focus on um, collaboration um, and to be regional specific. Um, there was only half a million dollars that the ACCD um, had for the whole state. Um, and so this, um, this, this proposal utilized the work that we've been doing over the last year uh, with Randolph in Motion um, and because every, every issue that we've done, we've gotten more uh, support from businesses. Um, and we've been able to really sort of highlight um, the things that are great um, about Randolph and the region. Um, and so the bulk of this is going to go towards the creation of uh, a really awesome website um, that will sort of be Randolph in motion um, and really be a the digital platform to promote the community um, and the region. Um, the other piece is going to be um, supplementing uh, Chandler's New World Festival um, and specifically with some additional marketing resources um, targeted towards 
uh, consumers in Quebec and Boston and New York. Um, and then the third piece of the grant is going to be uh, providing some marketing resources to Ridgeline Outdoor Collective um, because that is such a draw for the region um, and what they've really lacked um, up until now is just having any marketing resources whatsoever. Um, so, you know, it's $30,000. I think, um, you know, the Randolph in Motion piece is going to be between fifteen and $20,000. Um, and, and then also there's a little bit of money there um, to help with um, promoting the region through the use of um, getting, in essence, writers um, um, to the area to show them around the region and to give them some experiences that they can go and, and, and write about um, in, in some of their publications. Um, so a pretty exciting opportunity um, for Randolph um, in, in our region um, to make a big marketing splash here. So I'd, I'd love for you to, to consider accepting this, this grant. There's no match um, to it, which is awesome. Um, and they are in essence just using our project proposal as the, the grant agreement and for the deliverables. And I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. I'll move that we um, that we accept the grant as uh, as just defined by Josh. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any questions? Can I just ask briefly, what are the deliverables, Josh? Uh, well, the the website for one, yeah. um, and the the marketing campaign um, with Chandler um, to uh, for their campaign to, to, to targeted towards consumers in Quebec, Boston, and New York. Yeah. Um, uh, photography, obviously, that's going to be and maybe some some small videography um, that we use on the website and for uh, Ridge Lines marketing um, material, um, and then of course, like the the writer coming to you know being able to have a writer come to the area or or multiple writers. Um, and, and, and giving them that experience so that they can go and um, write about their experience in the region um, at, you know, at within their publication. Um, it could be, you know, some sort of like uh, trade journal or, or entertainment recreational journal, newspaper, uh, whatnot. Um, all of the collateral we, we said we would make available to the state of Vermont. Um, so they would be getting all of that. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Adopting the 22 certificate of mileage. is an annual occurrence and requirement. It ties into our state highway aid and that the calculations are based on our class one, two, and three mileage. There are no proposed changes. Once we fill out the totals, so basically everything in the previous mileage will carry across um, and there are no other changes, no new highways discontinued, reclassified, remeasured, or anything designated scenic. And we'll need at least three of you to sign it based on the way it's set up. And then we asked the town clerk to sign it. Uh, this comes to us from B-Trans, and then we'll send it back to the mapping division. Does this take into account, or was that last year that we had the discontinued roads? It should be already taken into account in the calculation, but I, I'll double check that to be sure, but they should already be out of that mile. Yeah, that was last that was last year, Perry. Okay, yeah, I wasn't sure where it <laughs> fell into the, yeah, when that time frame happened. So. 
All right, well, with that being said, I'd make a motion to approve the certification of highway mileage. Second. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next up, we have an assembly permit for Winterfest. I don't know who who wants. Do you want to introduce it, Perry, or do you want us to? I can handle that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, what this is, it's the same permit that you've seen for the last well, not last year, but the two previous years. There's not a lot of changed um, in respect to the event. So um, one of the things that I've discovered in handling this process is it's a little challenging to pin down the people that you need to get to sign off from this. So Kim had sent an email to these folks. I had talked to them personally. I don't know if they've showed up at the town office to sign these, but I had conversations with uh, Mr. Bonyak from the police department, and I had a conversation with Mike Hildebrandt. He asked a few questions. I addressed those, gave him a new map, and Kim was going to reach out to the health officer and public works director. I don't know. Do we have one of those anymore? We have a highway foreman, but I don't know if we have a public works director. So, no, it's one of the hats that I've uh, sometimes done for you. So everybody. Okay. Well. So well, that's left over though from when we did have public works. Yes. Buildings and grounds and highway was all one as public works. And then separate. So, anyways, there it is sitting in front of you. I think, Kim, did you say you've gotten a couple signatures now? Yeah, I got, I got all of them except for the. I got them all? Works. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. What, Trevor? I can help you with the public. Trevor can signature. do that one. Thank yeah. you, Trevor. So we're good. Perfect. You're good, Perry. All right. Any questions? No, but given that it's a public event and it's to support the town and whatnot, um, I believe there's a site out there that people can go to to sign up to volunteer and help out with it. Oh, yes. So um, so over the weekend, there's a website that went live. It's called rain.winterfest.com. It uh, basically gives you an overview of the event, shares with you the activities, as the parking situation um, addressed, talks about volunteering, talks about sponsorship. Uh, so my friend Valerie has done a pretty tremendous job of putting that together for us. As always. As always. As always. <laughs> she is a dynamo when it comes to yeah. this stuff. And so yeah, we've, we've, we've taken it to a new level where you can actually submit your sponsorship money online you can register for the event online you can you can sign up for the cardboard race box race online so yes we're we're moving and i will share with you that the initial uh facebook post from a couple weeks ago was shared 400 times which was pretty impressive so i think it's you know turning into a very nice community event so I'm looking forward to uh, getting up there when I get back and making some snow so I can support the water district. <laughs> Buy a little water. Nice. So, so yeah. anyways, that's it in a nutshell. Hey, like any Oops, go ahead, Tom. I, I was going to move the approval of the assembly permit for Winterfest 2022. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> motion carries. Next Thank you. up is up to business. Uh, I just wanted to point out one thing that I told the um, Arts and Culture Committee. Uh, I would do at their at their monthly Zoom meeting yesterday, and that is that, and and 
uh, Kim and Trevor are both aware of this. There are um, several openings on the Arts and Culture Committee, and they are um, soliciting uh, applicants for that for presentation to the select board. Um, they decided yesterday that any applicants that step forward, they would submit for consideration of the select board um, at, this, at the reorganization meeting following town meeting at the same time as they submit their own intentions to um, return for another year. So that's just a quick update on that. <clears throat> Yes. Any other items? Manager's report. Uh, the only thing to amend from what's written is in letter C. This is the federal ETS program. The Supreme Court voted 6-3 today to, to block the federal standards. So there's no OSHA or VOSHA temporary or other standard forthcoming. According to the communication from VLCT, this um, whole program is quote unquote effectively dead so for now um, take that off we were going to be in a spot where we were going to hit the 100 employee marker um, in the summertime with pool and camp and then it's one of those that once you hit that marker um, you stay there even after those um, camp counselors and lifeguards and others return and that's the reason we got to 100 was we had to count volunteer firefighters the five of you would have been counted in that um, under some of those standards so for now, um, there isn't anything we need to worry about with um, either mandating and requiring proof of vaccination or some kind of testing protocol for unvaccinated employees. We are following the general state and federal guidelines as we were before. No change. It's a long way of saying no change. Perfect. <laughs> Right, anything else in the manager's report? I don't think so. Executive session? We do have a couple of things. I can keep it quick with the late hour too, or we can, I do want to touch base on the on the personnel stuff real quick at a minimum, but. Entertain a motion to go into executive session. I move that we go into executive session for consideration of contracts, collective bargaining, and personnel issues. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stained? Motion carries.